We are marked. We are marked by the lines where smiles have been, by the calluses of our labor, by the scars of our struggles, and by the strength of our prayers, all of which tell the story of who we are. Yet there's another mark, one that sets us apart from others and from who we once were. Unlike our physical marks, this mark can't be seen by human eyes, nor felt by human touch. Yet it's as present as the wind in the trees, for it is the mark of whose we are, rather than who we are. We are not our own. Our stories, our struggles, our victories, and our joys are all part of something larger something greater than ourselves. This journey we call life is not about finding ourselves so much as it is about losing ourselves and finding Him. As we move toward discovering Him, we become free to explore the depth and breadth of His love and His being. We realize that being a saved people doesn't mean we are a safe people, set upon a shelf to await His return. No, we're not safe but rather we're sent from a comfortable place in society to the outcasts and the vulnerable, from an easy definition of friend and family to an ability to embrace the enemy with God's love from inside the church walls to a world outside that needs Jesus. Our vision is to join God in his mission to go wherever we must and do whatever it takes to penetrate the darkness and rescue the lost. We are set apart, we are marked, we are not our own, we are His. First one being in regards to the unity meal. The unity meal happens monthly, and that's going to be taking place tomorrow on the 15th from 5:30 to 6:30. So, if you would like to help us out with the unity meal, or you need, uh, or you just want to join us for food, that's happening the 15th, which is tomorrow from 5:30 to 6:30 p.m. The next one is in regards to care elder training. There will be a spe special care elder training on Wednesday the 17th at 7 p.m. So if you are a care elder or you know a care elder, please contact them and let them know that that will be taking place on Wednesday the 17th at 7 p.m. here at the Sheldon campus. Another special announcement is it's a time of celebration for a couple of families in our church. We want to remember the Browns and the Hitmas, Gary and Barb, and it's a time of celebration for them because, for Mike and Karen and Gary and Barb, it is their 50th wedding anniversaries this year. Yeah, two families, both buried 50 years, which is crazy to me because I can't ever imagine being married, much less for half a century. But that is fantastic. So we want to celebrate with them next week. As such, right after church, there will be cake and ice cream on behalf of the Browns and the Hitmas. So please join us for that. A couple more. I'm going to be out of the office this week. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of stuff going on denominationally and in our classes and in church, and I started forgetting more things than I normally do, and I'm a forgetful person anyway, and when that starts happening, my brain goes, you need a break. So I'm going to be taking Wednesday through Saturday morning off. I'm just, I'm not going to be leaving town, but I am going to not be in the office. So if you have any issues or you need anything during that time frame, I encourage you to contact a care elder, council member, or member of staff. And then the last one we have is in regards to today's worship. We want to welcome Scott Zeilinga, who is here. Raise your hand, Scott. So there you go. Scott is going to be giving us the message from the Lord this week, so we will ask a special blessing upon him as he gives the message. And as always, we want to remember our offering. There are many ways that you can give. You can go to forallwhothirst.churchcenter.com forward slash giving, or text your amount to 84321 and follow the prompts, and as always, offering baskets for the gifts will be passed during the first song, or you can mail them into either the Orange City or the Sheldon campus. 
I believe that's all I have for announcements this morning. Let's open this time with a word of prayer. Bow your heads if you would with me. Father God, we come before you today thanking you for the opportunity to do so. We realize that in our part of the world, we often overlook the importance of gathering to worship your name. We often take for granted that we get to be in your house, hearing your words, singing songs of praise to you. But yet, Father, this morning, that's exactly what we're going to do. And because we get to do that, Father, we are blessed. And so, Father, as an exercise, not only in in us receiving that blessing, but also out of thankfulness, we ask that we would meet your spirit where it's already at work in this place. And this morning, Father, may we praise your name boldly, and may we praise your name well. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, Living Water. Today's invitation to worship comes from the YouVersion Bible app, as a lot of uh, mine do anyway. Um, But today it's coming from the devotional Choosing Each Day, God or Self. Uh, The first part of this devotional begins, how do you wake up most mornings? Do you use an alarm of some sort? Do you hit snooze once, twice, seven times? Guilty. Do you lie in bed to thaw out for a few minutes, or do you get right up? There's obviously many ways to wake up, but most of us probably lie in bed for a moment to orient ourselves. As you start the process of doing that, do you begin to think about your day and everything that's before you? Where do your thoughts and your mind also go? We have a choice every day, every morning when we wake up. Will it be God or will it be self? And it's amazing how quickly we can make ourselves, our schedules, our to-do lists first in our thoughts and priorities, even on a Sunday morning when we're giving up to go to church? How often do we think of ourselves first and then maybe later at some point give a passing thought to God who we proclaim as our Lord and Savior, right? So what about you? What about us? What is foremost in your mind and heart when you wake up? Who comes first? How do you spend or start your day. Um, So as we begin worship this morning, I hope that we take this time to orient ourselves as we praise our Lord and Savior. Um, Welcome to everyone watching online as well. Um, Please stand and join us for worship this morning. compassion, love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me, everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of a nation. salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again Give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. And conquer the grave, Jesus conquer the grave. Shout your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shout your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the 
of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. One of the blessings that we have the privilege of undertaking from time to time is that we as a church get to welcome new families into our fold as a body of Christ. And we just so happen to have that opportunity again this morning as we welcome Nate and Kate Boss into the membership of Living Water Community Church. So at this time, Nate and Kate, if you would come forward. Now, Nate and Kate, as they make their way up here, have uh, been with us, I don't know, about a year, maybe, give or take. And I had the privilege of marrying these guys not that long ago. How long was it? Two, May. Three months. So these guys have been married three months, which is fantastic. And they just said, I didn't expect applause, but welcome to Living Water. It is a jo- it's always a joy for a congregation to welcome new members into its fellowship in this morning. It is a privilege for us to welcome Nate and Kate Boss into members of Living Water Community Church. This is our opportunity for you to not only enjoy all the benefits of full membership in this congregation, but it is our opportunity to walk with you as you live out your faith. This morning, it is our joy to welcome you as we walk together for the benefit of the Lord's kingdom. Nate and Kate, in your baptisms, you were marked as members of Christ's church, and we believe that the Holy Spirit has led you to this place and at this time for your own good and the good of this congregation. So, we invite you now to affirm your faith in Christ and express your commitment to the life of this church and the mission God has given to us in this community. And so, Nate and Kate, I ask you, do you affirm once again that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that the Bible is God's Word revealing Christ and His redemption, and that the teachings of this church reflect this revelation? What is your answer? Do you promise to join with us by sharing your gifts, walk with us in our worship and fellowship, and join with us in the mission God has given us in this world? Congregation of Jesus Christ, please rise in body or in spirit. People of Living Water Community Church, do you promise to receive Nate and Kate in love as your brother and sister in Christ, to support them with your fellowship and prayers, and recognizing their gifts, invite them into the life and mission of our congregation? Living Water, what is your answer? Amen to that. I think it's only appropriate that as we welcome these guys, we bow our heads with a time of prayer. I would invite, uh, I think, their care elder to come forward. Is it Sherry? Is Sherry, if you would come forward at this time. Let's bow our heads in a time of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of relationship. We thank you for the joy we receive at welcoming a new brother and sister into the body of Christ, which is your church. This morning, Father, we thank you for Nate and Kate and for the work of your Holy Spirit that has brought them here to be part of the Living Water family. And we ask, Father, that as we grow and develop deeper relationships with one another, that we as a church would support and encourage Nate and Kate, and they would support and encourage us as a church. We grow together as a family this morning, Father, not just for our sake, but for your glory, so that we as a congregation may, may more fully continue to live out the mission you have given to us in this community. This morning, Father, as we welcome Nate and Kate, may we as a church seek to serve you first, honor you with our lives, and spread your kingdom in all we do. Thank you for this blessing of family today, Father, and we pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Later on this week, Sherry will be giving you a card as a welcome, if she has not already. It's done? Fantastic. Living Water's ahead of the game for once. Nailed it. And I think it's only appropriate that we welcome Nate and Kate with a round of applause. And as we do so, 
Let's turn up the lights and greet one another this morning. Let's take a moment and greet one another. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father, it's who you are. Who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers, far and wide, but I know we're all searching for. You know just what we need before we we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am.
I was going to say, you may be seated, but it looks like you, you're a take-charge congregation. Jesse said, you better get up there so that we can sit down. So, good morning, my extended church family. My name is Scott Zeilinga. Um, I hail from Bethel Reformed Church, and they send their greetings. Uh, you may or may not know, I'm going to flip my Bible here. You may or may not know that we, uh, our sister churches in a very intimate sense because since our fire five years ago, uh, we have been able to utilize this building for our Wednesday night services and, and some other activities. Uh, Living Water has reached out in dozens and dozens of different ways on ways uh, on things that we could engage in as a church congregation by using your building. So uh, we are very, very thankful that in the last five years of not being able to be in our building, we can come and utilize this beautiful building and um, kind of do church life in the midst of, of our own congregation, but also interacting with you. So uh, blessings upon you just for the opportunities you have given us. Uh, I actually was church custodian for eight of those years, and as the church building got closer to being torn down, which if you dri have driven by the Bethel Reformed Church, it is no longer there. There's a, a good uh, plot of property that we can maybe plant corn on or something like that. Uh, but as I saw that building being torn down, getting closer and closer, my job went from lots to do to very little to do. And so I, uh, I went to the deacons before the deacons came to me, and I said, I think I'll, 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 I'll allow Bethel to not have to pay me a, a wage anymore. And I, I actually work at, live, um, at, not at Living Water, I, I actually work at Wheelchair Dynamics now. And I fix wheelchairs and I help customers and I install ramps and all sorts of things. So it's, it's a fun job. But I love being able to come and open the Word of God with a congregation. Um, one of the great blessings in my life is uh, just digging into scripture with people, whether that's being a teacher or being a preacher or whatever you want to call this capacity I'm in right now. One of the, my favorite things to do is to just dig into a story, to maybe a familiar story. Uh, I've been doing it with my, my family. We've been trying to do a parable of Jesus a day. It doesn't actually end up being every day, but a parable of Jesus as often as we can. And we've just been going through Matthew and digging up the parables, and we read the parable, and we talk about it, and it's just fun to do that. So this morning, I thought I would come, and I would bring a, another story. It's not a parable. It's a, one of Jesus' stories from the, the book of Luke, and it, it's, a, it's, it's the story of Zacchaeus. Now, to some of you who perhaps have grown up in the church, you've done Sunday school, uh, you've done VBS, you've had your parents or your grandparents uh, read you know, kid, children's Bibles to you, or, or the, um, the adult Bible, I guess you could say. Um, so you're very familiar with the Zacchaeus story. In fact, you might even know the song. There's a Sunday school song that goes along with it, and yes, I'm going to make you sing it. So if you, if you know it, sing along with me. It goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. 
I know you did not ask me to come so that I could sing well, but thank you for singing along with me. So some of you obviously know that song. Others of you, you're looking at us like, that's a, a goofy song for some Bible story that you're going to talk about. So this is maybe a hit or miss story. Some of you not, might know it very well, others might not, but we're going to dig into it. <clears throat> we're going to look at what, what Jesus said to Zacchaeus. So if you turn with me, if you have a Bible, or it'll be up on the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> if you turn with me to Luke 19, starting in verse 1, it says this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So Jesus is coming into town. He's been traveling the countryside, telling parables and healing people. In fact, right before this, he, re, uh, he heals a man who is, who is blind. And he's coming into Jericho now. And there's a man in town by the name of Zacchaeus. And it says he was a tax collector and he was wealthy. He was a rich man. Now, the tax collectors, uh, to just kind of put it in a nutshell, were employees of Rome, and they were, they were Israel people, they were Jewish people who were in Israel, but they were hired by Rome to collect taxes. And so they were under the employ of Rome, and so they were kind of loyal because of their jobs to Rome, so to speak, but they were also trying to collect taxes from their fellow countrymen, and so in general, people didn't like them. People would have to pay their taxes to these these fellow countrymen, and, and yet they knew that the taxes were going back to Rome, and it was just, it wasn't a, a great situation. And a lot of times, not always, I'm sure there were some righteous men. In fact, Zacchaeus perhaps was one of the righteous men. So they were getting paid for doing their job from, from Rome, but a lot of them would take extra money from the people. If Rome was saying, you, you know, the tax is $20, they would be like, oh, you owe me 30 bucks, and then they would pocket the tent. So people knew that as well. And so one of the reasons Zacchaeus may have been wealthy is because he was robbing from those that he collected taxes from. But he was a wealthy man. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Zacchaeus wanted to see who, Jesus, who is this Jesus? He knew he was coming through town, but there was a crowd around him, and Zacchaeus was not a tall man. In fact, in the Greek there, it's micros. He was a very small man. And Zacchaeus knew he could not see over the tops of the crowd, but he wanted to know, who is this Jesus guy? We're, we're used to thinking that rich people can just get whatever they want. Well, Zacchaeus couldn't use his wealth at the moment, to get his way. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't figure out who Jesus was by putting down some money and saying, get me Jesus. Instead, he does what? Verse 4, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So Zacchaeus knew he could not see Jesus. There's too many people around him. So he runs on ahead down the road and he finds a tall tree or a tall enough tree that he could see over the tops of the people, and he climbs it. He climb, he's a rich man. If you, if you picture a rich, a rich man today, uh, maybe a suit coat and it's high, maybe a briefcase and some really fancy shoes, you don't picture them being childlike and climbing a tree. So Zacchaeus, in his robes and maybe some gold, and uh, you know, he was a rich man, he runs ahead. He runs, and then he climbs, he kicks off his sandals maybe, and you know, takes his robe off, and he puts his, puts his hands up on the lowest branch, and he climbs the tree. There's some, there's some childlikeness going on here. Zacch Zacchaeus is putting away um, whatever embarrassment he might have felt. He's putting to the side his, his wealth and the, the, the status he had to climb up a tree. Why? so that he could see Jesus above the crowd. The next verse, 
verse 5 says this. When Jesus reached this spot, so Zacchaeus has gone on ahead and climbed the tree. When, Zac- when Jesus reaches the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? Come down immediately. I'm going to your house. Zacchaeus was looking to find Jesus, and Jesus found him. So Zacchaeus does what we, I think we all would do to some extent. Oh, you're looking for me? He even, know, he even knows Zacchaeus' name. That must have been a surprise. Zacchaeus is looking, who is this Jesus guy? And here it turns out Jesus knows his first name. He says, come down. So verse 6, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. He came down. Zacchaeus was realized he was being sought by Jesus, by Jesus. He was running ahead and he was climbing trees and he was, surely he was excited. I, I'm going to figure out who this Jesus is. I, I don't care about my wealth. It's not getting me anywhere. People don't like me anyway. I mean, who's this Jesus guy? And then Jesus stops under the tree and looks up and says, hey, Zacchaeus, come down quick. I'm going to your place. <clears throat> hospitality was a great, a big thing in those days. It still is to some extent. If, if you realize, oh, I have a guest coming over, you, you make them feel at home. You pull up a chair, you offer them some coffee or some water. You, you make a place for them. And so Zacchaeus comes down excited and says, Jesus is coming to my house. Verse 7, though. <clears throat> All the people saw this and began to mutter. <clears throat> they weren't even saying it too out loud too much. <clears throat> they weren't saying it to Jesus <clears throat> or Zacchaeus so much. They were muttering, what? Can you believe he's going to Zacchaeus' house? All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. This is so, so like crowds. I mean, if you can, if you can imagine... Um, someone in our day who is maybe rich or wealthy, maybe an actor or um, a, a rich, wealthy person, and God starts doing something in their life. Maybe it's reported on the news that they went to church or, or that they're a, a Christian. You know, God evidently starts doing something in their life. How quick are we all, whether in the church or whether out of the church, to be like, I can't, I don't know, is God really doing something in their life? We're all a part of this crowd at times in our lives. We all sort of, okay, Jesus, is Jesus really doing something in that wealthy person's life or in that, in that actor or famous person's life? Or maybe even in each other's lives, you know, like you hear a story of one of your brothers and sisters, oh, geez, God did this to me, for me, or, or through my, uh, you know, in my life. And we're, how quick are we to say, Really? Did he? So we're all part of that crowd. But Zacchaeus experienced it here too. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. It's kind of an indictment against Jesus. Like he's, he's, he's a healer. He's a, a prophet. He's the savior. He's the Messiah. And whether the crowd realized that or not, for, for him to be going to the, the house of, of a tax collector, it's just, oh. Anyway. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, he's not even saying to the crowd, he's not even trying to defend himself, he said, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus is already, he, he's come down out of the tree, he's welcomed Jesus to his house, and he's already being changed. We don't know what Jesus said to him at the house. We don't know if Jesus told parables or stories or just ministered to him in some way. But Zacchaeus is already showing signs of change, life change. He's saying, he's saying I, I, I don't need all this wealth. I'll give half of mine to the poor of Jericho. I'll, I'll go and anybody who I've robbed, 
Anybody who I've taken money from that I shouldn't have, I'm going to give them back four times the amount. And that, that might seem like a, an odd number. Well, you're going to give them four times the amount. But that's what was described in Exodus. I think it's Exodus 22.1, I believe. You'll look it up later. Exodus, that uh, the, the robber who takes from someone owes them back four times the amount. So it's not like you can steal 100 bucks from someone and just be like, okay, fine, here's your 100 bucks back. No, you have to, the restitution means you give them back more than you took from them. And here Zacchaeus is saying, I'll, I'll do that. If there's anything I've taken, I will give back four times the amount. So Zacchaeus is being changed. He's, he's, being, um, he's being used already by, by the Lord to go out and give back to the community, to, uh, he, imagine if Zacchaeus was sitting at his chief tax collector's table and he shows up at your door later and gives you back four times of an amount and you're like, okay, you're the tax collector, I paid my taxes to you and he says something along the lines of, I met Jesus, I, I stole from you, please forgive me, here's four times the amount. Imagine what kind of community change that might spark. Jesus says to him, verse 9, Jesus says to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. And Jesus is pointing out the fact that though society and the Jews in Jericho have kind of disregarded Zacchaeus and pushed him to the side, Jesus is saying, he too is a son of Abraham. He too is a Jew. Why shouldn't salvation come to his house? In verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is referring to himself. Jesus is the son of man. And he's going, he's going out. He's telling Zacchaeus, I've come to seek that which was lost and to save it. And Jesus always finds what he's seeking. So he came to Zacchaeus' home. Well, first he met him under the tree. Called him out of the, get down out of the tree. I'm going to your house. Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, has a meal with him perhaps, sits down for coffee, talks to him, ministers to him, blesses him. And Zacchaeus has the effects, the results of salvation already coming out of him. He's planning on giving his money away to the poor and he's paying back those he has robbed from because why? Salvation has come to his house. So there's a few contrasts in this story. I'll just point out a, a few of them. So Zacchaeus was a rich man but he was very poor. He had all the wealth in the world. He had everything going for him. He had all his needs met, and yet he was the poorest man around because he didn't have Jesus. He was a rich man who needed different riches, and Jesus came to give him true riches. He was also seeking Jesus, but Jesus sought him. He was going out. He thought he was, he was going, I'm going to, oh, fine, I'll climb a tree then. He was seeking Jesus, or so he thought, and it turns out Jesus was seeking him and finding him. Zacchaeus thought he was seeking Jesus, but he was being sought by Jesus. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus. But if we page the head in the chapter, it turns out Jesus is about to go into the triumphal entry. And a week later, he would die on the cross, having been lifted up on a tree and being seen by all mankind. He, Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus, and Jesus was about to be hung on a tree so that he might be lifted up to draw all men kind to himself. Zacchaeus didn't need to climb that tree. He probably could have just waited at his house. But Jesus was going to hang on a tree so that he might draw all people to himself. 
Also, Zacchaeus was a collector, a tax collector. He collected the taxes. He collected wealth. But because of Jesus, he became a giver. He was a collector, and the contrast is after meeting Jesus, he became a giver. I mean, who knows if he continued in his job in a righteous way, but maybe he'd be, he just started giving, he walked the streets. Oh, you need money? You're poor? I have money. I, be, I was a tax collector. Now I'm a giver. Those are just some contrasts. Uh, another contrast that, that I didn't write down here was right before this, this story, Jesus actually interacts with another rich person. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what do I do to uh, receive eternal life? And Jesus says, well, follow the commandments. And the guy says, yeah, I did, I've done that since I was a kid. And Jesus says, looks into his heart and sees an idol of wealth and says, okay, sell all you have and give to the poor and then come follow me. That rich man could not do that. He had such a tight grasp on his wealth and on his status that he went away dejected. Zacchaeus, though, according to the story, we don't know that Jesus asked him to give away his money. Out of the goodness of his heart, out of his life change, he did start giving away. There's a contrast there. The rich young ruler couldn't let go of his wealth. Zacchaeus, oh, he's suddenly free with it. Salvation had come to his house. So this is how the kingdom grows, even today. This is how we as a society, as a church, as a community, this is how the kingdom grows. Jesus goes to people's houses, so to speak. He touches their hearts. He transforms our families. He works in us and by, and it doesn't just stick in one place. It's not like Zacchaeus was transformed, and he went, and he sat, and he thought, ah, it's good being saved. No, things were happening already in Zacchaeus' life that he was affecting other people around him and in the community. He was giving away what he had. And this is how the kingdom grows in our day and age, too. You yourself might be touched by Jesus. Jesus might speak salvation to you, and it's not like it can just stay inside you and stay put. Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins so that we might be wiped free, set free from our sins, and live a new righteous light, a life clothed in the robes that he's given us. If Jesus has worked in your life and brought salvation to your house, the only thing to do is to turn around and start giving things away. Now, we're not all rich people. I'm certainly not. I assume a lot of us are not classified as wealthy by any means, but we all have riches to give away. We all have things that we can use in order to bless others. As Jesus works in our hearts, how can we work in other people's lives? And the interesting thing is, immediately after this story, in fact, um, it says... Uh, the very next verse in verse 11, we stopped at 10. In verse 11, it says, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. So while that crowd is around and Zacchaeus is still standing there, Jesus takes the chance to tell a parable. And what does he tell? He tells a parable about the talents, about a king receiving a kingdom and going off on a, on a journey and giving his servants talents and says, do stay do something with these, I'll return. And when he returns, he gathers his servants before him and says, okay, what have you done with these things? That parable is immediately after Zacchaeus had started giving away his wealth. And Jesus had talked about salvation in that household. What kind of things is Jesus working in your life, in your household, as you raise your kids or, or your grandkids, as you go to your job, as you um, interact with other people in the community? What kind of things has Jesus given to you that he is saying, salvation has come to your house. Now go and do things with what I have given you. He, 
He gives us gifts and salvation, not so that we can sit on our hands, not so that we can just go off and, and enjoy ah, a nice feeling of being saved. No, Jesus saves us wholly and completely. He pulls us out of our own tree. He goes to our own house. He brings salvation to our houses so that we can turn around and whatever riches we have, whether that's financial, whether that's um, hospitality, maybe you can make really good bread and you just just bring a, a neighbor over and say, hey, I got some bread and some butter. You want to come sit on my porch? We just got uh, a load from a friend of, of sweet corn. And I wasn't there, but my kids, my wife and kids told me that um, one of our, our community residents who walks around a lot uh, walked past our house. And they said to her, hey, you want some sweet corn? We had an abundance of sweet corn, and so give it away. You don't have to be a Zacchaeus who has the robes and the riches. You don't have to be a Zacchaeus who has a great job that pays a lot. And you can just be you and be giving away what riches Christ has given you in response to what he's done in your life. As he worked in Zacchaeus' life, and household, Zacchaeus turned around and was generous with what God had given him. Let's go and do the same. Let's be a Zacchaeus in our own way as Christ works in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this story in your word. Thank you for showing us that even when we are maybe thinking that we're seeking you, that you the whole time have known our name and you are seeking us. Help us to take whatever you have given us and to use it and give it away and be a blessing to those around us as you work in our hearts. Thank you for dying on the cross to save us from our sins and rising again from the grave to conquer death. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us first. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please continue worshiping with us. Higher than the mountains that I face. Stronger than the power of in the trial and the change one thing remains one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails Never gives up, never runs out on me.
so never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Friends in Jesus Christ, it has been a pleasure worshiping with you all this morning. I encourage you, whether this is your first time or hundredth time, whatever it is, to join us next week. We'll be picking back up in our series, The History of the Persecuted Church. I will be here giving that message. Until then, I ask that you remember the words that Scott gave us, and I think it's very appropriate for us as Living Water Community Church to be Zacchaeus and give to others what God has so richly given to us, which is his message that he loves you and died for you. Amen? Amen. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded us. And surely he is with us always to the very end of the age. We have one more song. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, to reveal the kingdom coming. To reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father. good for the lamb and conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint and by his blood his name is freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me praise the Father Thanks.